So conferences like this are really interesting. I haven't been to one of these in a long time. And yesterday, somebody was telling me, actually Kyle was telling me, who's sitting right there, that you've got to start with a story. You have to have a really good opening story. And my talk is all about language. Um, and how do you tell a story about language and words? And so I was walking back from the party yesterday, going back to my hotel room, and there are some theorists who will say that literally all of the language that we use is metaphorical. We're never referring to the thing itself. We're always using language to, to bridge this gap between ourselves and our feelings and other people. And so I was like, okay, what's a good example of something metaphorical and that's not literal? And I was in the elevator and I was going up and I thought, huh, like a word like starstruck. I mean, I'm not literally struck by a star. It means that you are struck by a star, you're struck dumb. And then I get to the second floor and the doors open, and there's Jordi Roca, the keynote speaker from yesterday, the most amazing chef in the world, pastry chef in the world. And I'm like, want to say something to him, but I literally cannot say anything. And I start laughing because I've literally been thinking about the word starstruck, and then I end up being starstruck. And so that's my opening story about <laughs> metaphoric language. I hope you like it. Okay, so why is, uh, why is metaphor important in the context of AI and technology? You'll see a lot of resonances with the work of Simona and Nick uh, in my talk, and I hope to sort of build on that. And uh, metaphors allow us to understand cultural meaning. And when we think about science and technology, metaphors are really important because they have this amazing ability to convey things that are complex, that we don't understand, and that are still in emergence. So let's go to Twitter, which is where I spend a lot of my time. The thing about AI is it's literally actually multiple things. There's this great um, tweet here by the American professor, Ryan Kahlo, who says that, you know, depending on what your audience is, this is what AI is. And I think we all find some resonance with it, right? Um, and I use this slide, I use this uh, screenshot in a lot of my talks and presentations because I think it's really apt. But it's not just, you know, press or, um, you know, the law or non-technical communities of people. Even AI scientists, the people who are sort of at the forefront of developing this stuff, don't always quite know what they're dealing with. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but we're trying to evolve it. But except on Twitter, it's happening on a large scale. So six months ago, the chief scientist of OpenAI, uh, Ilya Sutskeva, tweeted, it could be that large neural networks are slightly conscious. And immediately, you know, there was a thread of responses. Jan LeCun from Facebook said, um, no, it couldn't be conscious because com consciousness requires another level of computational architectures. Consciousness is about compute and data. Then Murray Shanahan, a professor at Imperial, said, that you know, um, neural networks are conscious in the way that a field of wheat may be slightly pasta. And uh, he's talking about this sort of like large gap that exists between wheat and pasta and consciousness and neural networks. And then yet another scientist, uh, Deborah Raji, said she was annoyed with the anthropomorphization of AI and that we shouldn't talk about AI in these human terms at all, that AI is just like a toaster. It's an engineered artifact like a toaster. See, that's the resonance with Simona. I had no idea you were going to bring up toasters. And now you could say on the one hand, this is an instance of terminological anxiety, a quote that actually the previous speaker, Nick, uses in, in one of his works. And this is quite common in science and technology because things are new and emergent. But this sort of language is demands clarity. What are we really talking about? If we want to make and regulate and shape these technologies, we need a lot more clarity and the obfuscation can be really challenging. So in fact, Georgetown University's Privacy Law Center recently put out um, a Medium post saying that they were never going to use the words AI and machine learning again uh, because they were just marketing speak and they were quite uncertain. Um, and, and they didn't really convey what was going on. So what I want to do is look at some visual metaphors. You may have seen some of these before. And I'm also going to talk about this global survey. Well, it wasn't a global survey. It was 13 countries and nine languages that we surveyed uh, about different kinds of AI metaphors in, in other parts of the world. So I really like this chart of metaphors for big data, which you've probably seen a lot of. And what they allow us to recognize is that the tricky thing about metaphors is they really work, but they start to apprehend the new and then completely shape that thing. So 
we don't refer to the thing itself. We're always referring to it in terms of its metaphorical language. And so then the metaphor and the thing itself start to construct reality. And you can see how then this goes into post-structuralism, and we're not going to go there in this talk, don't worry. But then this is very much about being intentional about language and where it comes from. This is another popular one in the AI space. This is by Max Tegmark, visualizes Hans Morovec's landscape of human competence. And what I find really interesting at this is the assumptions baked into it, right? That art and science are at the top, the pinnacle of human achievement, but translation and driving are at the bottom, these mundane human activities. But when you think about it, right now we have you know, alpha fold that is supposed to predict every kind of protein we want to make um, to address diseases. We have AI and art. And yet, things like driving, which people have been working on for the longest time in this space, you know, is still really, it confounds people. It confounds machine learning. Um, we have the Neural Network Zoo by the Asimov Institute. And you know, this resonance is something you're probably quite familiar with. AI is this non-human other, as something that is wild, untamed, and that must be constrained. And I'm going to get to the, the global metaphors or metaphors from other countries. And this was something we actually heard in South Korea a lot about uh, AI as a gorilla, as this you know, sort of like big, hulking, silent threat. And when I interviewed, I interviewed about 35 experts uh, from around the world for, for this work. And one of them was Kevin Kelly, the founding editor of Wired magazine. And he used the word alien, but not in terms of like, you know, alien from outer space. He was talking about how AI is actually something that operates very differently from humans, and it doesn't talk and it doesn't behave in ways that are legible to human systems, and that we're going to need AI whisperers one day. This is something that's already come up, and this is actually a very beautiful um, instance of metaphor. And I think Nick's work about traps as well is very beautiful, intentional use of uh, metaphoric language and ideas. And this is suggesting that, yes, AI ha is corporeal. It has a body that can be dissected, and we can show how extraction and labor is part of it. And one of the other persons, uh, people that I interviewed uh, for this work was Tim Mon, the writer, and he actually worked with Liam Neeson. Uh, Liam <laughs> Young. <laughs> um, gosh, there's so many resonances to other people in this conference. And he was part of this project that Unknown Fields did, and he was saying to me that, you know, AI is already here. And this is a line from his book, Infinite Detail. If you haven't read it, you should. Skynet is real, and it wants to sell you shoes made by child slaves. Tim says that AI is, you know, in, uh, is in automated decision making and in shipping and logistics, and it's already, it's already here. And here's a project from London called Better Images of AI. They're, rec they're recognizing that we have all of this metaphoric language that's taking us down the path, a path that we may not always understand or, or recognize or know entirely. And they're saying they want to change the stock photography about AI on the internet, the whole internet. So they are commissioning artists and designers to send them images of what AI is actually like. So if you have an idea, I would suggest that you actually pitch them. They'll put it up on the website. I mean, they need to change the whole internet, so they need a lot of people working on it. Um, and this is, of course, you know, I'm gonna like skip over this. You've seen a lot of this everywhere, and this is by Sherry Wong, like two and a half years ago when we started this project. Uh, Sherry was talking to me about it, and she said, let me make you a you know, humble Google image search um, of the ideas around AI. And we, tried, we wanted to do this with different VPNs to look at you know, in different parts of the world, what would you get, and it was pretty standard. But this idea of hands and fingers uh, and working together is a very big theme. In fact, when we looked at the advertisement that Microsoft has for AI, they draw on a very old idea in the study of technology. They say they have an ad with uh, Common, the rapper, and he's saying, you know, what's a hammer without someone to swing it? The idea that, you know, this technology is just lying there, ready at hand, and it's when you pick it up that it's going to actually do something. So it's in, it's in your hands. And OK, now I want to just move on to some other metaphors in other places. Uh, so I worked with nine students. I don't actually speak all these languages. I could pretend that I did, but I don't. And so what we did was we looked at policy documents, digital marketing, advertising um, in, in all of these different countries. 
And I'm going to go through, I'm not, I don't think I have time to go through all of them, but there are some good stories in here. So, of course, the most dominant one is, you know, this idea of data and AI as gold and minerals, things that we can extract, fiebro del oro. You know, there's the idea of this frenetic speculative gold rush that we see in countries trying to get rich off AI. But nobody knows quite how that's going to happen, but that's what they all believe. And uh, one of the things I heard in India was, uh, and this has to do with the Shah Rukh Khan uh, GIF that you see. So I was speaking to uh, tech consultants in India, and they said, um, AI is like Shah Rukh Khan. You just need a little sprinkling of it to make your project go really well. And for those who are not familiar with Shah Rukh, I mean, greatest movie star in the world, he, if he's just even remotely associated with your project, if there's a cameo, if he's producing it, if he endorses it, it's going to go really well. And, uh, okay, it went off for a moment. And so, so AI is like Shah Rukh Khan. Uh, India also sort of like trying to promote itself as the lab and the garage. The lab is this very sort of like formalized space in which science happens. The garage also is sort of legendary in Silicon Valley culture is this more sort of um, place where you can just muck around and, you know, make magic. Uh, we're not going to talk about the Indian economy, note to self at this point. Uh, but I, I quite like the temporal metaphors that came up, this idea that AI will help less developed countries in the global south to leap ahead to the future to gain some kind of economic or geopolitical advantage to catch up with the West, obviously. But what people in Africa and India and um, places like Mexico were saying to me was that this is, again, technology as a silver bullet. You know, even in the number of years that I've been working on technology, first it was video, then it was mobile phones, then it was big data. It's going to make us, you know, sort of leapfrog over poverty and hunger. But this just sort of allows bureaucrats and governments to think that, you know, they're absolved of their responsibilities of actually doing the hard work of democracy and equity and uh, equality in society. So all of this enthusiasm about AI that I was hearing in India and South Africa, which is basically, you know, lots of data from, from big populations, was tempered with anxiety in places like Europe and the US, where, of course, there's this narrative about jobs and job loss. And I was talking with the German media theorist, Christian Katzenbach, and he was telling me that in 40 years of Der Spiegel magazine covers that had uh, about AI and automation, for 40 years, every single cover had a picture of the white thinking robot. You know the one. Um, and it, and, the, and the, he was basically saying that it's not so much about robots taking jobs away, but that the German state's identity and of itself, its idea of itself, is based on this idea of a contract with the citizen where you're always going to have a job. And so this is less about individual anxiety and more about a collective and state anxiety as well. Um, and of course, in Japan, a very, very different kind of more sanguine relationship with AI where the space between machine and human is not haunted, but is more sweet and poignant. And of course, you know, the Japanese people, uh, experts that I interviewed, always talk about this in terms of how the emphasis on care and cleaning robots in Japan sort of comes together with the fact that this is a country that strongly resists immigration in an, eff in an effort to maintain the, the purity of, of their society. And so you need to have a lot of emphasis on, you know, development of care and cleaning robots to do the work that um, labor from other countries cannot do for you. And so I asked the experts who I interviewed, if you couldn't use the words artificial intelligence, what would you call it? Because I wanted to sort of think about how hard it is to get past the language that we have. It's not easy to just come up with other new metaphors, as all the designers and artists in the room know. So these were the metaphors that they came up with. And they, they were saying that they wanted to move away from the flowery ideas and just talk about what the thing is and what it does. And that's what AI scientists like Stuart Russell will tell us, that the reason that we actually need this clarity is because we're not being able to specify what it is exactly that we want it to do. Do we want it to actually replicate human intelligence writ narrow, understood very specifically? Um, and if we do, then that's one particular trajectory that we're already seeing playing out. And instead, we have to maybe think a little bit more broadly about how we understand our relationship with these technologies. And I'm going to end with another image uh, that I really like from 
uh, the better images of AI, and this is by uh, a friend and collaborator, Philip Schmidt, and this is actually a laptopogram which was made by, um, uh, Philip basically found this data set called the Olivetti Faces data set from Cambridge in the 1990s, and he exposed the data set to photographic paper and developed it in his bathtub. He wanted to show dust and fingerprints and marks on the print to show the researcher's subjectivity and to show how there are actually people inside these systems putting them together and sort of bringing their ideas and their language. So the person who controls the metaphors, the person who thinks that it is a toaster or a pet is going to start or has already started setting you know, um, AI in motion and sort of letting us think about what the future of uh, our relationship with these technologies are going to be. So it is, AI is neither magical nor inexplicable nor neutral, but we have to sort of think about what does accountability mean? What does regulation mean when you think something is a toaster and when you think something is a pet? And I want to suggest that maybe the magic may be experienced as we move towards greater clarity about what we're doing with it. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Thank you Nick. Thank you, Simone. Okay, we have a little bit of a time for an audience Q&A. So we have Monin over here. She has a stick mic and she's happy to bring it out into the room. If someone has a question, you can raise up your hand. No one has anything to say. That's great. Thank you. Okay, so then I will jump into the opportunity and take a question, right? So I think in this session, we had a lot of like conversations about what is the metaphors, how to use it, and et cetera, et cetera. We also covered that it has a body. Um, but right now, that body is kind of controlled by a very few and very large private companies, right? Like, it's something we didn't directly address, but it's kind of embedded in the conversation. How do you think about that as someone who both works with AI and also, like, studies and stuff like that? Easy question. Okay, then I have to take the grenade. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I mean, so first of all, um, wor working with those company, I neither deny or I, was, I played the fifth. <laughs> uh, no, but I think, yeah, I mean, I think in one hand there is a, I mean, of course there is a lot of uh, resources in order to develop all this algorithm that, uh, you know, small companies cannot do yet. And so at the end of the day, but luckily there is a lot of like open source things that you can play with. like. I, I played with tools, so I don't know, I didn't know that much about code, but luckily because even big companies are releasing, uh, you know, algorithms and you can play them with and other people build tools like, I don't know, Runway. So, I mean, there is a bit of an, op there is a, quite a lot of open possibility, even though, you know, when you look at the, at the base, you know, the, the, the starting data sets probably are the problem because those are being done by someone and you don't have access to that and all the biases, all the problems come from that. So, yeah, there is no, Solution. <laughs> <laughs> There's no solution. <laughs> you agree? Yeah, I, I mean, one of the things that uh, I think I realized in the course of working with people working on recommender systems was that um, when they started getting into this field, most of these people were working on sort of very small things, right? The recommender was in the corner of the system that you used. It wasn't like the whole thing. And we live in a world now where not only is, you know, if you use a, a service like Spotify or Netflix, the recommender system is sort of everything, right? It's the entire interface, but it's also then even bigger than that, right? The whole music industry, all sorts of industries are getting filtered through these systems. And they didn't start in that place. They started like these sort of traps as like a thing you sort of tuck away in the, in the corner. Uh, and so one of the things that I sort of deal with in, in my book a little bit is that, that weird feeling that people who are really enthusiastic about this technology and help to build it have over time of realizing this looks very different. This works very different when it works at large scale. And not to go into the, too much of the trap thing, but there's this uh, kind of trapping called landscape trapping, which is pastoralists will sort of organize a whole landscape in order to sort of organize the flows of animals within it. So you can sort of make it so your animals are already effectively caught just by living in the place where they live. And I think that's what we see now uh, in the design of these systems because they're built by such uh, hegemonic and powerful corporations. That's not a solution. <laughs> no, it's good. I mean, we can we can end with the question. That's okay. We have actually oh. the audience starts to open up. Y here. Humans, yeah, other humans. He's human. I also had something to say on that, but I okay, can come yeah. after the question. Yeah. Hi, that was great, by the way, all of them. So I'm Meg from New Orleans, and I'm wondering, or 
I'm under the belief that I can personally jam the algorithm. <laughs> Am I deluding myself? I think you may have like a better sense of algorithms, Nick, as in like jamming them. I think that obfuscation is always helpful, like always hack the system. Um, but that's not a technical response to, you know, can you actually block the algorithm? I don't think you can. But there's nothing you can do that isn't a signal. Mm. Anything you're going to do in response to one of these systems is a signal, whether, whether it's not using it or using it in a way that you think is silly. It's always going to be a signal for something. Mm. Yeah. I will just repeat it. Uh, so can I pass my own equity? Uh, yeah, can I bust my own echo chamber by clicking on things I don't like or don't believe or don't care about? Maybe. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, but because I was talking about uh, with him about the music and the, the first example I remember when uh, Spotify Discover Weekly came out, and you know that was the first time that an algorithm clearly defined me as a particular music taste, and I felt offended because I was like, you know, do, do I only like German electro music? Like, what the fuck? I mean, I'm I'm, I'm different, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, and, and so then I started, you know, because I, Spotify algorithm is pretty, it's complex, but you, it, it's very sensitive. So then I started, oh, I'm gonna give you some fella cutie there, and now what do you give me? And at the end of the day, everything ended up being lo-fi dubstep. So you can mess with it, but it's going to be dubstep. <laughs> I, I was going to say that actually, I think there's, the, the question is not, can I get out of it? But, all, but actually, how do I survive this catastrophe that I have, that we have no ways of actually controlling through individual means? And I think that's what a lot of us are more motivated by. And just to sort of like plug my work and what I do is that we recently started teaching a master's program to people like you actually, practitioners who are already working in government and industry and business to think about what is the space for re-architecting any of these things? Because our notion of things like regulation is, oh, it must come from the top down, or it must come through people and workers' movements, and you know everybody can obfuscate. But I, I think it's actually much more mundane and banal because people often at the forefront of these things feel like, if they don't act now, or if we don't individually act now, everything's going to go to shit. And I don't know if it's always like techno, <laughs> dystopia and utopia are not so um, clear and always like on this knife edge. You know, everything is much more banal and along the way. It's sort of like everyday practices and you know, being in solidarity in different ways. So I would say that the people that I teach are trying to bring a little bit more reflection to what does it mean to change the relationship that we have with software, with industry. I mean, let's not hold our breaths for Mark and Jeff and you know all of those people uh, and their their handmaidens. You know to, okay. to change. Okay. Thank things. you. <laughs> <laughs> uh.